Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast I'm about to do. I got a tricky one. It's got some contours in it, so I want you to listen well. The title of it is The Surprising Truth of Why a Husband Devalues His his Wife. If you're listening on YouTube or Rumble, would you please subscribe to that channel? It will help us to organically reach more people with the practical message of Christ. I'm so glad that you are here. You can read, watch, or listen to this podcast that I'm about to do. Thank you again for joining me on the video. A husband who devalues his wife did not just become that way. There is always a trail that leads to this type of outcome. Devaluing a spouse is a symptom not a cause. And there are two ways to keep from marrying such a selfish, devaluing man. One, you must recognize the early signs and run before the trail heats up. The second is much harder. You have already married him and are reaping the whirlwind of his selfishness and devaluation of you. There is still hope. There is still help. For this second situation, though it will come through God's strength perfected in your weakness. Hello everyone, this is Rick Thomas. You're listening to the Life Over Coffee podcast. I have an article for you. The title of it is, The Surprising Truth of Why a Husband Devalues His Wife. Now you can flip this around if you wish. You can call it The Surprising Truth of Why a Wife Devalues Her Husband. But I've got to talk about one gender just to keep the symmetry going and so that we can have a a logical train of thought. But please, uh, with most of our content, you can flip it around if you wish and make the other application if it applies to the other person. But again, in this case, I'm going to talk about why a husband devalues his wife. Now, you can read, watch, or listen to this resource. I'm doing the podcast right now. I'm also recording the video as I am doing the podcast, and so you can watch the video of this podcast production. And of course, you can go to the website and you can read this article if you wish. I would encourage you to do that, and perhaps you don't know, but at the bottom of all of our articles is a print button, and so you can print it off into a PDF. I know that some people print our articles off and put them in a book, in a binder, and they keep them as a reference manual. Our articles are evergreen, primarily, I would say about 98-99% of all the content we produce is evergreen. What that means is, it's good for the day, it's good for 100 years from now. Different from time-dated material that has a 48-hour or one-week shelf life, where it's talking about a current event. I don't typically talk about current events, I like talking about stuff that applies generationally. Therefore, our ministry, what we have been doing for the past 14 years, hopefully it will continue on long after I am gone. And so the title of this article, the video, and the podcast is The The Surprising Truth of Why a Husband Devalues His Wife. Now, this, this resource here has a lot of contours in it. And so there is a circuitous route that I'm going to take you through. And so you want to listen very carefully. Let me begin by introducing you again to my friends, Biff and Mabel. Mabel met Biff when she was 17. He seemed to be the perfect guy, at least to her. Biff showed love to her and she liked the idea of someone loving her. Within a year of dating, they were having sex. She realized her value to him, but dismissed his selfishness as a guy thing, never learning how his devaluing of her would manifest in many other ways after they were married. Mabel was not a confident person, which created insecurity that prohibited her from saying no to his advances. Fear of man, or fear of Biff in this case, is a dastardly thing. In Mabel's mind, she needed someone to love her, and she was willing to give in to Biff's lust. It's analogous to a girl allowing the next-door neighbor boy to abuse her favorite ragdoll. 
The girl did not value her doll. She was okay with the neighbor boy devaluing it, abusing it. So it did not matter what the next, next door neighbor boy did. In the case of Mabel, tragically, she grew up and married the next door neighbor boy only to find out that he devalues wives too, Mabel specifically. Biff used Mabel to satisfy his lust during the dating season and the devaluing problem compounded as she became the object of his anger. Another way a man would devalue his wife not just sexual activity in the dating season. That is devaluing, but so is anger as well. Biff's sins are not Mabel's fault. I want you to hear that quite clearly. I'm going to restate that in just a moment because it needs to be repeated. Mabel's fault. It is not hers for what Biff is doing. But there is an insightful question that somebody needs to ask a girl like Mabel. And so I am going to ask you, Mabel, and I hope I can ask it long before you commit such, commit your life to such a selfish person as Biff. The question is, why did you marry him? Now I'm going to interact with this question primarily throughout this podcast. And I hope, this is my prayer. I hope that it will dissuade many young ladies from making such an unfortunate mistake. And so as I work through this case study, let me reiterate, because I want to be doubly clear. If someone devalues you, it is not your fault. They are devaluing you. You may be at fault for making a wrong decision by marrying a jerk, but you're not the cause of his sin. Too many women heap the guilt of their spouses on themselves, and they further punish themselves for a problem they did not cause, which adds layers of complicatedness to the already complicated situation. And so I'm going to move through these layers, but one of them is not self-imposed guilt for another person's evil actions. Be free from this kind of thinking. To take on another person's sin leads to more self-devaluation. You can't do that because that will lead to more unfortunate relational choices. But there is another kind of guilt I do want you to consider. It's the girl who does not value herself. And this kind of devaluation predates her infatuation with boys. I'm going to explain that with Mabel. The girl wrapped in this type of guilt begins to think lousy guys is all she can get. That is a setup for someone as selfish as Biff. Because she feels terrible about herself, she complicates matters by choosing these sorry guys. I'm going to talk about this problem of devaluing oneself, and then I hope that I can bring some solutions. And so let me begin with the most stern warning that I can give you in this podcast. If a guy does not value you enough to abstain from fornication and you later willingly give yourself up to him, why are you surprised that he mistreats you after marrying him? I had this counseling session a number of years ago. I wrote an article about it, the man who committed adultery, and as I began to talk to the wife about it, I realized they fornicated during their dating relationship. And I asked her the question, I mean, if you, if you fornicated while you were dating and he commits adultery 20 years later, he has never changed. And that was a surprise to her. And so why are you surprised that he mistreats you after marrying you if, you fornic if he fornicated with you during the dating season? Don't you know that the little neighborhood boy who abused the doll does not fundamentally change after becoming an adult? Though he does not throw dolls across the room for kicks, the heart issues that motivated him to do so are still present. The difference between the boy the neighborhood boy and the man you married is how he manifests his selfishness in ever-increasing and damaging ways. He no longer devalues dolls. 
He devalues his wife. The objects of his sin are different, and the consequences of his sin are exponentially worse. But he's still the same kid, only in a grown-up body. And so now, Mabel, I want to talk to you as you think about how possibly you can get into a place of devaluate, devaluing yourself that you do find yourself marrying a lousy guy. Though God made Mabel in his image, she came into the world broken. All babies enter the world with a functional deficit called total depravity. Mabel was not what God intended her to be. She was born like the rest of us. You, me, Mabel, and everyone else, guilty before God, totally depraved, broken through and through. Mabel was a spiritually broken baby when she came into the world. Every person is born in sin, guilt, shame, fear, and the temptation to lean into self-reliance, an unbelieving mindset that relies on oneself rather than relying on God. The fundamental problem with Adam and Eve, they chose unbelief, which is a synonym for self-reliance, and that is our temptation as well, also wrapped in sin, guilt, shame, and, and fear. We all sense and know there is something wrong with us. And though no kid can articulate the internal awkwardness in their souls that there's something broken inside of me, they intuitively know that there is something internally wrong. Even the Gentiles who are not in a Christian environment, they know that something is wrong with them. Paul talked about this in Romans 2, 14 and 15. And this is a reason for biblical parents, they must come alongside their children to instill in them a better way. Jesus Christ is that way. Parents lead their children to God, the only one who ultimately can restore them to his intended purposes. If God does not save a little girl like Mabel, she will, if God does save a little girl like Mabel, she will experience transformative restoration of the soul. We call this initial restoration, regeneration. They are born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus in 3.7 of John. And then from there, the child enters into a process of sanctification for a complete repair which will find fulfillment in heaven when they become entirely when we become entirely sanctified we call this part of our salvation experience progressive sanctification the process of maturing into Christ likeness after we are born again of course there are many ways a parent can fail their child by making things worse than when the kid first arrived into this world a broken baby totally depraved I've said this often, and it needs to be heard that a child does not end up in jail at 15 as I did all by himself. I am not putting the weight of my sin at the feet of my parents, but I'm also not going to ignore the harmful shaping influences of a parent that can help facilitate a child's decision to, to make uh, such a decision to end up in jail as I did. If the parents do not do a good job, this deficit that the girl feels in her soul, this total depravity, it's like it, it widens, it grows. She will grow progressively needy, which will tempt her to look for love in all the wrong places. Let me give you a few examples of how parents can fail their children, how, how they can be a secondary complicating cause to their children who make poor decisions as they grow up into the teenage and early adult years. For example, here's four. The parents could have a miserable marriage, one of the most effective ways to create dysfunction in a child. Number two, the dad or mom could be angry, critical, or neglectful. Number three, they can withhold love and encouragement. Number four, they can be dismissive, preoccupied, or generally self-centered and self-serving. These attitudes or behaviors can heap more ruin on an unregenerate child, creating more complicatedness in their souls. And from a poor parenting model, Mabel will begin searching outside the home for community and connectedness. With the image of God in worse shape than ever, now as a teenager, 
Mabel will not value who she is, a person made by God. Note how James thinks about image bearers in James 3, verses 9 and 10. He talks about the Lord esteems his creation so much that he frowns on anyone who messes with his creative acts. James is talking about a person who uses abusive language toward another image bearer. He rebukes anyone who speaks harshly to another human. His reasoning for why it's wrong is that God made us in his image. That's why James says it's wrong to bring any harm to another human being, regardless of their salvation experience. The ESV says that we are made in the likeness of God. Because Mabel was not cared for correctly, not only did her parents devalue her, up by their poor parenting, but she never learned to value herself. She began to believe the lie. They don't like me. I don't like myself. She exchanged the truth of God for a lie. What she did is she began to take on the world's version of self-worth, which is self-esteem. That teaching is godless, as it devalues the creator and exalts the creation. Biblical self-worth recognizes the value of the painting painting only because of the importance of the painter. We would have no value if God were not so magnificent. You and I are a person made in the image of God. That's why we have self-worth. That is why we are valuable. And that's what James was getting at. And so your goal should be to get to God so you can fully realize all he can do for and through you, which is mainly to put himself on display through you. This kind of image of God teaching never occurred to Mabel. Rather than having a God-centered view of who she was and what she was supposed to be, she devalued herself. Her parents did not value her either, which makes sense why she began looking for someone to love her, someone to pump her up, the self-esteem theology. This tactic is the world's version of self-worth. Do something to make yourself feel good about yourself. When a person seeks to do things to make themselves feel better about themselves, but does not have a gospel compass, their pursuit will be self-centered and self-destructive, and that's what happened to Mabel. Guess what? Mabel began dating boys at 15. She was naive and not prepared for this new adventure with parents fundamentally disqualified from parenting and Hollywood and social media as her tutors, she began, or she entered, the adult world of romance. She did not know how to value herself as a woman made in the image of God, so Biff began to make advances toward her. She interpreted his advances, his words, his behaviors as good things. She saw them as making her valuable. According to her inverted way of thinking about value, Biff's desires for her meant she had value, and she amped up the manipulation by creating a sensual narrative that presented herself in such a way to allure Biff's native, depraved instincts and lust. She did this because of her understanding of self-worth was from a worldly model of self-inflation. Both of them were selfish and misguided. They called it love. God called it sin. They married and she was angry within one year of marriage because he did not value her the way she thought about herself. It was two empty love cups colliding daily. The question is, why would he value her now? He never did. Nobody, past or present, has ever valued Mabel. But Biff was not the only person who did not like Mabel. Her parents did not like her. I mean... It, it sounds crass, but that's the only way that you could say it. If they valued her, they would teach her the way of God. But Mabel also did not like Mabel. The mysterious irony here is that she continues not to understand why Biff mistreats her. Premarital sex, or 
physical romantic involvement is the first clue you're about to marry a selfish person. This behavior is a clear sign that a person will diss God, devalue you, and seek to satisfy their self-centered lust. In situations like this, being mad at the boyfriend is not the primary or the proper response. There is something deeper here. As I said earlier, this is a symptom, not a cause. You can get married, mad at the symptom, but that will not help you. Biff is being Biff. He has never changed. He has been what he has always been, selfish, angry, lustful. Too many girls do not understand what I'm saying, or they don't want to acknowledge their culpability for getting to where they are. Only the grace of God can change a person like this. If the boy next door devalues your rag doll, do not be surprised if he devalues you. If God does not supernaturally change him, he will not transform, and selfishness is what he always will be. This problem is one of the biggest dangers to the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon from a few years ago. Perhaps you remember it. Any woman who does not think enough of herself to value what sexuality is supposed to be should not be surprised when she lands in a self-centered romantic relationship. Women's Fifty Shades romantic craze, which was a thing, and it still is, it is the reverse effect of porn. Let me explain. A guy who looks at porn devalues women, much like the ragdoll illustration that I've been using throughout this podcast. You become what you want. Millions of guys would love to find a woman who likes mommy porn. This sexualized response from a woman would be the ultimate score for a guy. If a woman does not care about her image of God and how God thinks about her, she will more than likely find herself in a bad relationship. Let me be more direct, because this problem is just this severe. I've been counseling for a long time, and I have seen so much of this, I can't even recall all the times. If you don't mind filling your head with a load of manure, don't be surprised if a load of manure shows up on your doorstep in the form of a guy who would love to get his hands on you. As I wrap up this podcast, I want to give you two sober calls. One is a call to girls. The other is a call to dads. Girls, guard this treasure. You're the treasure. You are a woman made in the image of God. If a guy wants to take God's image and devalue it, you should run as fast as you can from such a person. Paul said it this way in Timothy. Timothy 2.22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. If you don't do this, the end for you will be a buffet of bitter herbs. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of women reading or listening or watching to this article that I'm sharing with you, and they are attesting to what I am saying. Many of these women feel stuck in their silent prisons of relational regret. They did not think about being God's creation, choosing instead to let someone define and defile them. If you are not married, you do not have to do what they did. You can guard God's treasure, which is the person God made you to be. Think about your life like the rag doll in my illustration. If a guy does not treasure your doll, you must quickly disqualify him from receiving a more fabulous prize, which is you. You have value because God values you because God made you. A sober call to girls. A sober call to dads. Dad, you are stewarding a treasure made by God Almighty. Be careful how you steward this gift. You receive this gift in a broken condition, but God has called you to be part of his restoration team. Don't defile God's image. You will set her on a course that will become progressively worse if you do. She will think about herself the way that you do, which is poorly. 
She will seek worldly means to fill the gaping holes in her soul, as I've illustrated with my fictional character, Mabel. This process will not end well with her. Only the grace of God can change a wrong course, but it can change at any time. Let me give you a few ways that change can happen. I'll give you four. One, dad can change by imitating Christ more effectively by restoring his child to God. A girl can become a Christian and earnestly pursue God in her progressive sanctification. Number three, a teen can repent of all devaluing sins, be free from all guilt, and pursue God in her sanctification. Number four, a married woman can repent of any sin committed, be free from it, and pursue God, though past actions might have ongoing consequences. The agonizing trouble of the devalued married woman is complicated because she can't get out of her marriage. She will have to live with the consequences of her sinful choice of marrying the boy next door. She needs to surround herself with God's community to experience their nourishing and cherishing while becoming a sanctifying witness to her husband. There is probably no biblical warrant for divorce. I said that she cannot get out of her marriage. That is something that you would need to discuss with your pastor and other spiritual authorities. God's gospel community means many things. The most obvious is the local assembly, the body of believers serving each other. And then there is prayer and the word of God. Those are obvious choices too, along with solid gospel-centered music. You want to create these gospel tributaries that are flowing into your mind and into your life. An older and wiser woman in the church is a big plus. The devalued wife must create these gospel tributaries that can rescue her from the ensnaring mental warfare that she will be in. This battle calls for God's community to come to her aid. The hope is that God's people can not only persevere with her, but God's people will appeal to her husband to change. The title of this podcast, the article that I'm sharing with you, is The Surprising Truth of Why a Husband Devalues a Wife. Let me reiterate one final time. Your husband's sins are his, not yours. Stay focused. You are not responsible for anyone's sin. Don't heap that guilt on you. But please have enough self-awareness, have enough biblical maturity uh, to be able to think about how you got to this place where you are. And though you might not be the primary cause, there could be things that have been working in your life for several decades. The one that I'm putting my finger on in this podcast is how we can devalue ourselves, how our shaping influences can also tempt us to devalue ourselves to where we give ourselves over to a person who, who it, it is his lifestyle to devalue you. And though Mabel may not have the life she dreamed of, she can experience an incredible life with God and his community as she worships him out of her weakness. And so with the call to action, I want to uh, ask you five things that I trust they will benefit you. Number one, what does it mean to boast in your weakness? Now, perhaps if you would study 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 through 10, where Paul received his thorn in the flesh, maybe even memorize it to learn what Paul learned about God's strength, finding perfection through his weakness. You're on that path so what does it mean to boast in your weakness? Number two, what does it mean to have a sound theology of suffering? If you're unsure, will you talk to a mature believer who has gone through the crucible of suffering, coming out the other side maturer because of the suffering? What does it mean to have a sound theology of suffering? Number three, are you tempted to heap guilt on yourself for poor past decisions? What is the process for casting those transgressions on the Lord? If you don't know how to do that, please seek that person who can help you cast those transgressions on the Lord. You cannot live with complicated guilt. There are too many other things that you need to focus on. Number four, will you do the work of respecting your husband 
a fellow image bearer. Your respect might only be because God made him in his image. Sometimes that's all you have to respect him. But will you respect him so that your attitude toward him will not be evil? Number five, what else do you need to change from what you have learned here? Thank you so much for listening. It is the surprising truth of why a husband devalues his wife. Mm -hmm.